Here we are, folks. Hard to believe it's been a whole year since the utter desecration of arguably the most beloved series in recent years, and certainly my most beloved leading into 2019, the worldwide phenomenon that was Game of Thrones. And we have none other than the dynamic duo of stupidity, apathy, incompetence, and retardation that is dumb and dumber to thank for it. Bravo! The two most infamous pair of storytelling jackasses that will forever go down in history as being responsible with television's most colossal blunder. Now, a lot has happened since then, so the video will progress as follows. Firstly, just a short introduction about myself and what I've been up to since Game of Thrones ended, if you haven't been keeping up with the channel. Then there will be a short overview of the past year and certain developments regarding Dumb and Dumber, which have surfaced in the past 12 months, that you might be unaware of if you've been out of the loop for that long. And then finally, we will proceed to the main portion of the video, and the Lost Inside the Episode documentary for the Game of Thrones finale. I've left a timestamp on screen if you would like to skip to that. Now, since Game of Thrones went off the air, I've been busy with a lot of my other content. I primarily talked about Star Wars before my channel obtained a Game of Thrones audience, and my series Revenge of the Prequels kind of took off this past year, which I'm very grateful for. And it was honestly very surprising, to be honest. There was also Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker, Hobbs and Shaw, Terminator Dark Fate, all of which pissed me off to high heaven and required my full attention. Also, since the last Game of Thrones video I've produced, I've started the channel's Discord server, which has become highly engaging, and it's been an absolute blast interacting with you all there. And I hope you too join the Discord. The link is in the description. I've recently started a channel merch store and most recently committed to starting a second channel for my gaming content. And in addition to that, the channel's weekly podcast has been making strides. So yeah, it's safe to say I've been a bit busy, and I'll elaborate more on all of that towards the end of the video. Secondly, a quick recap. After the show went off the air, I have returned to the subject of Game of Thrones for various updates since the show's ending regarding these two individuals. But I haven't really dedicated a lot of time to the subject, because, well, there's not really much more to say. There's no more theories or speculation, and we have seen the entire show and nothing new is on the horizon. The Game of Thrones prequels, to my knowledge, is very much up in the air at the moment. HBO has cancelled at least one of the prequel series, and who knows for the future, honestly. But thankfully, Dumb and Dumber have lost their contract for Star Wars. They will not touch a hair on its head, thankfully. I mean, Star Wars is already dead. The Rise of Skywalker buried the coffin. But these two are probably the only storytellers on planet Earth that I am convinced could surpass Ryan Johnson levels of stupidity regarding the Star Wars franchise. So thank merciful Christ that isn't going to happen. Dumb and Dumber has also publicly admitted that they were surprised that George and HBO trusted them with the series after they completely botched the first cut of the pilot episode. Apparently by the end of the first cut of the pilot episode, the test audience still had no idea that Jamie and Cersei were brother and sister. They, to paraphrase, couldn't believe HBO gave them another chance. Then you go to HBO, you make a pilot, which did not they did not run. So, it didn't come out yeah. good. No, we, we made every possible We've mistake. never done this before. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, so if you remember, at the end of the pilot, um, Cersei and Jamie Lannister, who are twins, uh, are having sex. And at the very end, we looked at them and said, OK, you know, what do you got? And are those two blondes? Are they related in some way? Like, are they? Con they didn't know. They didn't realize that they were brother and sister. So we had messed up the the most kind of obvious storytelling possibilities. And uh, HBO, for some reason, decided to give us another chance. How many millions of dollars do you think they wasted on that first pilot? Ten. I don't know exactly. Ten million. <laughs> I don't know exactly, but I think about ten point six. <laughs> I'll link all relevant videos below. But yeah, in a post season eight interview. Dumb and Dumber basically owned up to what we were all thinking after season 8 ended, which was that they had no idea what the fuck they were doing. And because they had no idea and couldn't be bothered to tie in the intricacies of George R. R. Martin's lore, they purposely dumbed down the show for the likes of soccer mums and basketball players, according to them, by excluding the majority of fantasy elements and plot lines so that the casual audience could easily digest it. In a nutshell, they fucked over everyone. The hardcore book readers were insulted for having crucial book elements and plot lines excluded, and the show watchers like myself got screwed because we were given a watered, dumbed-down version of the books and sold a lesser product due to pure laziness and dumb arsery. And what good elements there were in the show amounted to nothing anyway. It was one big fuck you, almost a decade in the making. Not to mention, and unsurprisingly, they were too cowardly to dare show their faces 
at the San Diego Comic-Con event last year, but thankfully Seth Rogen had our backs. I also know that their showrunners didn't show up because they didn't want to answer questions about the show. So uh, I just want to say that I, I, I am not one of the creators of Game of Thrones, but I am the creator of other TV shows, so feel free to ask me any Game of Thrones questions you guys have. <laughs> throughout the night. I'm not an expert. I didn't read the books, but I watched the show, so I can give you my insights and thoughts just as to hey, hey, how Seth, they pulled it off. What, yeah. what, a, see, what series finale is going to be more satisfying, Preacher or Game of Thrones? I think, I, I, hopefully, I, I won't be, I, I'm here at least, so I think that's a good <laughs> sign. So yeah, if you hated Dumb and Dumber before and haven't been keeping up to date, rest assured it's only gotten worse for them in the months since. I know a lot of you have wanted me to talk about Game of Thrones since the show wrapped up at the end of May last year, and again, while I have made smaller video updates regarding these two idiots and the show, I was holding off for two reasons. Firstly, I wanted to wait for the DVD release of the final season for the special features and audio commentaries to be released, because I would then have more information and could close more loose ends regarding speculations people had about the final season post-mortem. Let me give you an example. In the season finale, I had to debate so many people about the weather conditions for when John is walking up to the Red Keep to kill Danny, that he was in fact walking through a blizzard, but people were telling me that John was walking through falling ashes due to the city burning. Well, it was confirmed by Dumb and Dumber themselves that it was in fact a snowstorm, not ash. Yeah. Even a snowflake dropping, you're right there. Look at that. And I know, and then it just uh, melts. It's weird hearing you talk after Details. you're dead. And that's just one example, and again, that's why I wanted to wait. But the second reason I delayed was that I was simply waiting for the right time to return to Game of Thrones. And well, it's been a whole year since Season 8 aired, so here we are. Now thanks for staying through the lengthy introduction. Now let's get into the meat of this video. This will be a response style video similar to my Revenge of the Prequels series. You probably remember HBO used to release these inside the episode documentaries after every new episode for Game of Thrones aired. Just to stroke the nutsack of these two buffoons. It's also where this iconic gem of incompetence came from. While well, Danny kind of forgot about the Iron Fleet and Euron's forces, they certainly haven't forgotten about her. I even dissected one of these gold mines of hilarious self-admitted stupidity from Dumb and Dumber the past year. It was the season 8 episode 5 inside the episode documentary titled The Bells. I responded to their reasoning or lack of reasoning for having Danny go insane and genocide an entire city as well as the episode massacring just about all of the other characters of interest this show had left. So after that clusterfuck, and the Snoresville excuse of a finale that was episode 6, I eagerly awaited the release of the next and supposedly final installment of Game of Thrones inside the episode starring Dumb and Dumber. But here's the funny thing, those documentaries usually release the instant the premiere of a new episode is over. And so I waited. Minutes. Hours. Days. Weeks. Months, and now an entire year. But it never came. And after dissecting the last documentary those two moronic dipshits starred in, I can't even imagine why. <coughs> Smart move by HBO not to release it. At this point, the backlash was at its peak. The fans were not happy, and HBO were watching, and you're releasing any more footage of these imbeciles that they stupidly trusted would only give fans even more fuel to burn them at the stake and incinerate HBO along with them. Wisely, that episode was not released. But then something happened on the DVD release of Game of Thrones Season 8. The special features footage was released in a similar format as the Inside the Episode documentary that used to be released on YouTube, and it was titled Duty is the Death of Love. It is around 30 minutes long altogether, containing interviews regarding the finale of Game of Thrones from cast and crew, but most curiously, all the parts where Dumb and Dumber discussed their writing choices on the finale, you can tell they were ripped from the Inside the Episode series and tucked it away in the DVD and Blu-rays, where people couldn't openly show their disdain for the showrunners and the behind-the-scenes information regarding the terrible last episode. The way they did for the previous behind-the-scenes episodes that HBO decided to release publicly. Now, I'm not the most tech-savvy person in the world, so I would have had trouble capturing and compiling the footage all on my own. But thankfully, The Dragon Demands has done us all an excellent service, and has compiled the footage of not just the documentary, but he has cut out all of the unnecessary footage that don't involve the showrunners. So what you are about to see is a supercut of Dumb and Dumber telling their audience of tens of millions of fans how they came to their decisions 
on the finale and what it represents. Now this is Dragon's video that I will be responding to, and the way he likes to do things is by using written captions for his own commentary. We will be going through his supercut and you'll see his captions on screen, but in addition to that you will have my commentary sprinkled throughout, as I respond to the verbal diarrhea pouring out of Dumb and Dumber's cunt mouths as well as some minor editing changes by myself, clips I've inserted to help provide context and extra info surrounding certain events or statements. I have linked Dragon's channel in the description, please check him out. He has hated these two writing hack jobs longer than most people on the internet and has a greater insight into the dumb fuckery of these two idiots than I ever will. So with all that said, ladies and gentlemen, let's get into this. It's the culmination of this grand story that we've all been a part of that started in the beautiful mind of George R. R. Martin. 16 seconds in, and they're throwing up the George R. R. Martin safety net. Hey guys, just remember, this long road to dog shit all started in the mind of George R. R. Martin. Remember, this is George's story, and this is George's ending. It's funny when and when they decide to bring George up, because on many occasions they have no problem referring to themselves as the creators of Game of Thrones. Hi Star Channel viewers, I'm David Benioff, this is Dan Weiss, and we are the creators of Game of Thrones. You can catch all eight seasons right here on Star Channel, we hope you enjoy watching and re-watching the show. And propping themselves up, and taking creative liberties all their own for their quote-unquote Persian rug of a series. And there was the coffee cup, and, and uh... You know, I think in, in Persian rugs, it's, it's tradition that you make a little mistake when you're making the rug, because only, only God can do anything perfect, and, and uh, so for us, I guess that was just our That's why assignment. I put the coffee cup there. <laughs> and yeah, that's true pertaining to the show, but the show itself is an adaptation, one that wouldn't exist without Martin. And yet George actually wanted more seasons, as did HBO. So is it really the culmination of what George intended? We all know the answer, but more on that soon enough. One of the things that Dan and I hoped to accomplish with this series was the sense of a story with a real beginning, middle, and an end. For that to work, the final season has to feel like it was where it all came together, or it all fell apart. <laughs> Oh, this is just too juicy. No wonder HBO pulled these from the internet. This is such delicious poetry that not even Shakespeare could write. You could certainly say that it fell apart, or more accurately, that it was burnt to ashes. We kind of built out characters and storylines, and now everything is coming together. Having tied all the knots, it's such a beautiful episode and wonderfully written and directed by the two men that created this madness themselves. Wait, Maisie. Didn't this start in George's mind? Dumber over there just said that it did, well, when it suited him. These two imbeciles with barely a writing credit to their name shouldn't have the accolade of being called creators. Not that the label is much of an accolade at all, but they didn't create this, they adapted it from the original creator's work. Then they proceeded to throw the roadmap for his creation out the fucking window, followed by a healthy stream of urine. Bear in mind, Maisie Williams' own boyfriend at the time of the season 8 table read thought Arya killing the Night King was a mistake. And not to attack Maisie, I'm very much a fan of hers, but to call this episode beautifully written is laughable. But I don't blame Maisie. This piece of shit footage was merely a small snippet for the camera intended for a very public video to be played on the internet to what HBO thought would be a fantastic and celebratory conclusion to the worldwide phenomenon that was this show. It's just a shame HBO didn't do their research. But then again, they never did. Well, and good like for, for them, by the way, for having that faith in you yeah. guys. That unfounded, ridiculous faith in you yeah. guys. <laughs> could almost, could almost call it foolish faith. <laughs> it yeah. Almost foolish faith. If two buffoon-looking individuals walk off the street with barely a writing credit, one being a glorified secretary and the other one being Daddy Wartbucks's weasel-looking son, and they walk into your office with someone else's writing material, not their own, and you give them a chance and they still manage to fuck the pilot and its most important plot point right the fuck up, that should be a massive red flag. If HBO did their research on this project, they would have realized, hey, let's talk to the original author and throw these guys the fuck out. But unfortunately, HBO learned their mistake too late for all of us. 
Often the best stories are the ones that are both completely surprising in the moment and then in hindsight have an air of inevitability. You have got to be fucking with me. Oh, this story was surprising for most of us in ways we couldn't have imagined because it was literally the dumbest big budget shit on the television screen in 2019. No one guessed Bran, the unbelievably dull, would have been the King of the Seven Kingdoms. He spent the whole season establishing a dial-up connection and being connected to an entirely separate plotline altogether, only to be crowned King on the basis of having the best story of all things, when the character who had the best story was locked in a dungeon, and not even part of the bloody conversation. And no one would have figured the Night King, King of all the undead, the badass, chilling main villain of this entire series would amount to nothing and go out like a total bitch, along with his army, because Arya instant transmissions to his location out of nowhere and kills him when she has no character through line or plot relation to the White Walkers whatsoever. And you say these outcomes are beautiful because they were inevitable. Seriously, you deluded, smug little rat bastard. Anyone with more than one functioning brain cell could have come up with something more satisfying and fulfilling to the audience, who up till this point had shown a decade of loyalty despite your insulting incompetence. In terms of the final episode, even just thinking about, you know, where these characters end up, which of them survive, which of them die, that's something we've been talking about right from the get-go. I'm sure everyone knows by now that that's absolute bullshit. They used the source material of the books in the beginning and followed it faithfully to a degree, even though they cut out extra plot threads to funnel the story down a more narrow, simplified tunnel. Some of the most obvious examples that I'm aware of being the Taisha storyline, the Jane Paul storyline, and most hilariously, Euron Greyjoy and Old Valeria. According to this, they made these decisions to dumb down the source material to exclude the fantasy elements, due to appealing to a more mainstream audience. However, they lack the foresight to realize, oh shit, what the fuck do we do with these characters if we aren't taking them down the correct paths? Okay, well let's just send Jamie to Dawn for no reason, feed Sansa the Ramsey, and let's turn Euron Greyjoy into an absolute meme-generating joke. So yeah, you may have been talking about where these characters were going to go from the start, but that's not how they ended up where they did, you lying little shit. You and that empty egg-headed partner of yours changed your minds impulsively throughout the entire show. Guaranteed, you fed Sansa to Ramsay because you reached season 5 and you said to yourselves, Oh shit, how do we fill this plot thread? Hell, you guys put more time and thought and foresight into the zombie polar bear than the entirety of season 7. What we had to go through to get the zombie polar bear was writing the zombie polar bear into every season of the show for about four seasons. We thought they'd be so excited to do a zombie bear. We cannot afford a zombie polar bear. And we really put our, our four feet down and we said, God damn it, we want a zombie polar bear. And there are recently documented examples of you changing your mind at the drop of a hat, deviating from George's outline and focusing on the meta surrounding the show. Fan theory, speculation, and making tweaks both minor and massive to subvert expectations and drastically rewriting plot lines or rewriting the characters as a whole, betraying their foundation in order to achieve your shitty vision. The biggest examples being Cersei's miscarriage. Um, and we should not have seen that never made it into season seven, which was where I lose the baby. And it was a really kind of uh, traumatic and Arya's triumph over the Night King, which I've covered earlier on the series, but we will cover this more in depth in just a few minutes. And I think it was around season three when it all started to make sense to us exactly where it was going. Unless you recorded this during the release of season six, which you didn't, you recorded this between 2018 and 2019 as part of the documentary for season eight, unless you recorded this back in 2016, you are lying through your teeth. You're changing the dates and timeline of events behind the scenes and where the ideas for these ridiculous shifting plot lines came from for your own benefit. So you can go on camera and say, this was where it was planned right from the beginning. Why is everyone getting so bent out of shape? We knew what we were doing. You just didn't get the ending you wanted. 
when in actuality you've actively changed the outcome from what the fans wanted and what you yourselves in the show set up to look like two writing geniuses who subverted expectations when you're really just two writing hacks. The end of an era, it's the end of a story. I think it was very important for them that they directed the last episode. We've known that we wanted to direct the final episode since probably season three when we directed our first episode and really enjoyed the experience. As you can see from Dragon's commentary captions here, Dumb and Dumber aren't trained film directors, nor do they have any directing credits to their name outside of Game of Thrones, with the exception of a short film by this guy. They directed three episodes of this series, season three, episode three, where Jamie loses his hand, season four, episode one, where little of anything happens, and of course, and most infamously, Season 8, Episode 6, The Iron Throne. With the most wasted screen time in the history of television and multiple water bottles left on set during filming and kept in due to negligence. After editing, which was due to Dumb and Dumber's overall incompetence. I understand the intention of wanting to give the show a poetic end by having these two weasels who started this adaptation to be the ones who finished it, and to be completely fair, and this is a bit of pill for me to swallow, the final episode has some of my favourite visuals in the entire series. However, due to the context of these images being a gigantic clusterfuck, I find it extremely hard to enjoy them. But in addition to that, if the majority of how the final episode looks is due to the asshole but still talented cinematographer of this show, then that would explain a lot. But it also doesn't change the fact that this was arguably the easiest episode to direct. Because you have some of the most talented actors in the world, a blank check from HBO, and nothing fucking happens. The episode is 95% filler and 5% actual plot. Almost a solid hour was dedicated to walking and staring and shifting fucking chairs. Yes, poetic it was. Dumb and Dumber directed the final episode and gave us one last hurrah of just how untalented they are. Our favorite part of working with them is that they listen to everybody and they listen to ideas. They might not always accept them, but their door is always open. Uh, no disrespect, ma'am. But if their door was always open, and they supposedly listened to cast and crew feedback, did no one knock on the door and shout at them after the table read, and ask them if they had lost their fucking minds? Sounds to me like you're full of shit. Because if we watch the table read, you can see both Kid Harrington and Conleth Hill have an issue with what they are reading. You're telling me no one voiced any grievances? Not to mention, there's this little gem. And originally we were going to send a firebomb through here that was going to burn them all to hell and then Dave and Dan decided they wanted to find the, they wanted they wanted Tyrion to find the bodies in six. Yeah, that was they were powerful. Like, you can't, yeah. you know, they can't they can't be tainted in any way. They can't be smashed up and I was like, "Well, how the bloody hell are we going to do that?" Yeah. So we covered them in bricks. Anyway, moving on. I just don't think they could give that episode to anyone else. I'm sure they've sort of been dreaming about the way the shots should look. We knew episode six couldn't just pick up visually where episode five left off. And well, it kind of did. The city was burned to the ground and everyone was dead. And Arya rode off on a white horse for some reason. And then we teleport to Tyrion, which meant that the whole Arya horse thing amounted to shit, just like the rest of this show. Not to mention, how's about you show us Danny's reaction to all this horror as she's high on the dragon? Give us some further nuance on her mindset other than leaving us to assume she's simply crazy or she got angry because a castle looked at her funny. I think from the very beginning we knew that a very large part of episode 6 in the beginning especially was going to be not about what was being seen but about the person who was seeing it and what it was doing to him as seen largely in shots that stay very close on Peter's face. Yes, the filmmaking brilliance of Dumb and Dumber and their abilities to zoom in on people's faces will stand the testament of time, I'm sure. A true game changer for visual storytelling and what future generations of aspiring filmmakers can watch in awe and pride at their marvelous work. I'm all for seeing the devastation and shock on people's faces. I'm also a fan of things actually happening in this fucking show, especially when it's the last bloody episode of this decade-long series. I don't need to see every individual step a character takes it's weird you have no objection to teleporting characters to their respective destinations, but for some warped fucking reason, you seem to always teleport the wrong ones. Danny has been 
been above it all, literally, throughout this entire battle. She's fought the whole thing from the air. So when she's in the plaza, all she's seeing is her own armies triumphant in the city that she came to conquer for all the best reasons. And I think the idea of spreading her brand of revolution around the entire world is a very attractive idea to her. At this moment, in her mind, it's a very ethical idea because she's not seeing the cost the way John and the way Tyrion have seen the cost. Ah, <sighs> let's watch that one more time. The ethical idea, because she's not seeing the cost the way John and the way Tyrion have seen the cost. You demented retard. What are you talking about? Danny hasn't seen the cost. She burnt them all alive. Not to mention, does Danny also have Alzheimer's? Did she just forget that half a million people occupy King's Landing? Look! Look at this shot! How does Denny not see the horrors and devastation she caused? Hundreds and thousands of people she burnt alive, and among the ruin, just a handful of survivors who have likely lost their families. Even if she has a bird's eye view from 5,000 feet in the air, it's hard to miss half a million people burn alive. Not to mention she's actively targeting civilians, and she's on the dragon. You're actually fucking framing this like Daenerys didn't know she was killing innocents. She was actively hunting them down, you jackass! So don't sit there and tell me she didn't know the cost. And I'm not even a fan of Danny. But what I will say is this. Daenerys Targaryen doesn't have short-term memory loss, doesn't have impaired eyesight, and isn't fucking retarded. And last but not least, she isn't fucking crazy. You made her crazy to satisfy your subversion itch and nothing more. Also, in the Inside the Episode documentary for Episode 5, you say this. We wanted her to be just death from above, as seen from the perspective of the people who are on the business end of that dragon. In most large stories like this, it seems like there's a tendency to focus on the heroic figures and, their, and not pay much attention to the people who, who may be suffering from the repercussions of the decisions made by those heroic people. And we, we really wanted to keep our perspective and our our sympathies on the ground at this moment because those are the people who are, are really paying the price for the decisions that she's making. The real reason we didn't see Daenerys at all while she was committing these horrific acts is because you dumb shits were too fucking lazy to provide us any nuance to explain her motivations and her train of thought for why Daenerys Targaryen committed genocide and betrayed every one of her ideals and the very traits that define her as a character, which so many people looked up to up until that point. What's interesting about it is that she's been making similar kinds of speeches for a long time and we've always been rooting for her and this is kind of the natural outcome of that philosophy and that willingness to go forth and conquer all your enemies and it's just not quite as fun anymore. You're saying we as the audience disprove of Danny's speech because conquering isn't fun anymore. Conquering was never meant to be fun. We were watching Daenerys climb back to her supposed birthright and free slaves along the way. It was cathartic for us as an audience because we saw this girl come from nothing and leave a huge positive impact on the world. Also, again, you and your idiot partner used that word inevitable. It was inevitably leading to this. Sorry, but what the fuck? Daenerys was trying to liberate people from slavery and from tyrants and simply wanted to reclaim her ancestor's throne. She wasn't conquering for the sake of conquering. And now her speech basically says we reached our goal, let's keep liberating cities by burning them to the ground. That's fucking retarded. And doesn't make any sense with Daenerys as a character. It's just not quite as fun anymore. Again, they keep going back to Season 3 as their safety net. We decided this in Season 3, and that in Season 3, and oh yeah, we decided this in Season 3 as well. The cersei Jamie plotline in Season 8 went under massive rewrites after they opted to not show Cersei's miscarriage and impulsively threw in Arya in place of Jon to kill the Night King. God, I think it's probably three years now or something we've known that it was going to be Arya who delivers that, that fatal blow. We hope to kind of avoid the expected and Jon Snow has always been the hero, the one who's been the savior, but it just didn't seem right to us for this for this moment. And to add on to Dragon's commentary, they use the term we came up with, despite this coming from, quote, the mind of George R. R. Martin. Given what Danny did, I'm perfectly fine with John killing her, 
but it's unbelievable to think he'd need convincing to kill Daenerys after her horrific acts. Jon needs to be convinced of the shocking revelation that he is, in fact, Jon Snow, protector of the people. That's the meat of this episode. Seriously, the conversation with him and Tyrion coupled with the walking, and the walking, and the walking, and the staring, and then more walking, took about 20 minutes, which is an absolute joke. What a waste of time. Fuck you. I think the final scene between Jon and Daenerys is something we came up with sometime in the midst of the third season of the show. The broad strokes of it, anyway. In terms of the final episode, even just thinking about, you know, where these characters end up. Don't pretend you did any thinking whatsoever. If you used your brain, you would have completely rewritten this abominable mess instead of carrying it through to the final fucking product. Which of them survive, which of them die. That's something we've been talking about right from the get-go. And I think it was around season three when it all started to make sense to us exactly where it was going. Like I said, they're both falling back to season three was the year of revelation. Keeping in mind that's absolute bullshit, shouldn't you have known from the start if you were indeed working with George? I think the final scene between John and Daenerys is something we came up with sometime in the midst of the third season of the show. The broad strokes of it anyway. But there was a tremendous amount of pressure to get it right, because we know that this is not a scene that's giving people what they want. Okay, so you outright admit right there that you made an active attempt to make sure you didn't give the fans what they want. Because we know that this is not a scene that's giving people what they want. And for what? Some out of place, moronic, spiteful, narcissistic subversion? Storytelling at its core isn't about catering to a fan base. It's about telling a story. Your story. The fan base gravitates to a story depending on how well it's written and how well they connect to it. But if you're letting what fans do and do not want dictate your moronic decisions, then what's the point of telling a story at all? When I go to a movie, for example, and I'm seeing a sequel to a movie I love, I will have several theories based on my own speculation and what the writers have set up. That doesn't mean I hope the writers are catering to my every demand or are trying to do the opposite of what I want. I want them to tell their story organically, uninfluenced and authentically, but my passion makes me want to try and guess what they are going to do. Storytelling is not about letting the meta surrounding it dictate its direction. However, when it comes to adaptations, which is what Game of Thrones is, there are exceptions. Because this is not your work. These are not your characters. This is a universe you are playing with made by someone else which already has many loyal readers and passionate fans. They, as well as the creator, would have certain expectations that demand respect, a level of faithfulness to the source material. When it comes to adaptations, this should absolutely dictate the story. What you don't do is deviate from the source material, go into business for yourself, and then resolve every single fucking decision you make around fan service or subverting expectations. It's one of the, it, it is one of those things that for every person who criticizes something vocally there for all you know there are 10 people who really enjoyed it but it's for whatever reason they're not putting their voices out there so you can't you just if you start listening to every every criticism it'll it'll tear what you do apart because the criticisms are many of them mutually exclusive the people they're going to be people who think it's moving too quickly they're going to be people who think it's moving too slowly people who think there's too much violence people who think there's not enough violence and we just we make the show that we want to watch and we would want to watch if we were reviewers so uh, some people are going to like it and some people aren't and you don't read anymore what what people no. say online no. I'm what Dumb and Dumber have said in this interview outlines my point about storytelling almost perfectly. So why do I have a problem with it? Well, firstly, they clearly walked back on this concept during seasons 7 and 8, using the meta to dictate the story and also catering to fan service or internet memes, Clegane Ball being the most obvious example. Secondly, not letting the meta dictate a story doesn't mean you shut yourself off from criticism completely. Valid criticism can help you achieve your original vision to the best effect. Theories and memes do not fall into that category. And finally, you say... And we just, we make the show that we want to watch. This can also be applied to movies and books and other forms of media as well. And that's the right attitude to have. Tell your story, be bold, put your ideas out there and see what the world thinks. The problem, once again, is that this isn't your story. This is someone else's that you've taken. 
and other creators' work that you have adapted, a fan fiction you've made based on something you will never fully understand to the creator's extent. So you don't get to say, we're going to do whatever the fuck we want with it, and the fans can fuck off if they don't like it. It's about simple ethics here. Ryan Johnson made a fan fiction movie as part of a franchise he did not create. And then afterwards he admitted not only that he did not know about the franchise's own lore, but that he openly did not care for it either. I use Star Wars as a prime example because similar to Game of Thrones, the new movies are helmed by people who aren't the original creator. It's funded by a company who bought the IP and writers who think they can do whatever they want because legally... The original creator doesn't have the rights to it. And again, legally they can do whatever they want. And because of this, they think that ethically they can get away with it. And once more that they should be praised for it, which is laughable because they sure as shit didn't earn it. Disney bought Star Wars and funded it. Kathleen Kennedy was given head of Lucasfilm. J.J. Abrams and Ryan Johnson were given Star Wars to write about. Neither one of these parties ever earned the IP or the popularity that came with it. Similarly with Game of Thrones, HBO funded it, and the author of A Song of Ice and Fire gave the showrunners legal permission to use the IP, but Dumb and Dumber never earned it. Hell, they botched the pilot episode and cost HBO millions, and that's just one example. We got there and was just kind of like, oh my god, this is going to be so emotional, and then it was realizing that we actually had to do so much work to get all those shots that we needed. Please, Danny. Can't hide behind small mercies. There's this discussion through the whole show of, of whether or not Daenerys is like her father, who was insane. No, that was a theory of her possibly turning mad at some point. Up until literally season 8, episode 4, there wasn't any indication of insanity. The Mad Queen Danny theory was a part of the meta surrounding the show, not the show itself. But again, you pretty much squashed this theory in season 6, didn't you? She's not her father, and she's not insane, and she's not a sadist, but there's a Targaryen ruthlessness that comes with even the good Targaryens. But remember, everyone, according to this jackass, this was all planned in Season 3. They had all this planned out, apparently. Anyway, as you can see from Dragon's commentary caption, what Dumb and Dumber are saying is not what Amelia Clark thought she was portraying the character as according to the instructions they gave her. I've taken a small clip from another one of Dragon's videos and inserted it here for context. Much to your amusement, it's a video HBO made for the Game of Thrones channel regarding Episode 5, and it was titled Game of Thrones Season 8 Episode 5 The Mad Queen. And this was taken down, as you can see, it's unlisted, due to how unbelievably contradictive it is to the nonsense spewed from the showrunners who insist that Daenerys went crazy when in actuality, according to Amelia Clarke, that's not quite the case. But what baffles the fucking shit out of me is how the dates do not line up. As you can see here, the date of uploading this video is May 9th, 2019, which is in between the release of Episode 4, Last of the Starks, and Episode 5, The Bells. This is a featurette of The Bells that was created before that episode's official air date. My original theory, based on how this lines up, is that they made the featurette and were prepared to release it, but they decided not to. Instead, kept it unlisted so as not to look like complete and utter fools, whether it was due to this staggering hatred for the Inside the Episode documentary of Episode 5, or the fact that Amelia's description of what she was told didn't line up with what Dumb and Dumber have to say about her character in the documentary surrounding the finale, we can only speculate. However, Dragon does go on to show comments from this hidden video from people who managed to somehow watch it. In the brief window, it was appeared to have been made public. So did some bonehead accidentally upload it and release it ahead of schedule? Because again, the video says it was uploaded before the episode aired. How the fuck does this even happen? As if the leaks for this season weren't bad enough which pretty much spoiled the entire thing for us, and thankfully so, because I would have been much angrier had I actually seen it unprepared. But seriously, how is there this much of a disconnect between the studio and the showrunners? Anyway, let us proceed. I'm going to play Dragon's editor of the featurette, because he has already accounted for the YouTube takedown bots, but in addition to that, I've linked the unlisted video, untouched, still on the Game of Thrones channel, in my video's description if you would like to watch it completely uninterrupted. And yes, bafflingly, you can still watch it, because they haven't taken it down yet. Now before I play the featurette, I need to backtrack a few seconds and repeat this piece of footage to have it fresh in your minds. There's this discussion through the whole show of, of whether or not Daenerys is like her father, who was insane.
natural for a person to retort to anger. And so that's exactly where she goes. And it's there. It's always been there. It's what's drived her throughout everything. I guess I didn't see particularly that, that Danny would just firebomb the city. Here comes that familiar feeling of anger, and she doesn't do anything to choke that. She lives in it. It's this feeling that you could call Targaryen craziness, you could give it all of these names that it doesn't deserve, because it is just... grief. It's hurt. And she has this ability to make that hurt a little bit less just for a minute. And here she is sitting on this ridge, and there's the emotion, and there's the feeling, and the feeling is to fucking kill her. Sorry. I don't think that Grey Worm can ever really see Danny as the Mad Queen. To him, she actually has a very clear sense of what's right and what's wrong. When you, f when you feel that much, when you feel that much failure and disappointment and shame and hurt and lost love, there's only so much pain you can handle before you snap. According to Amelia Clark, Danny wasn't crazy. She simply snapped in a fit of rage. Once the grief hit her all at once, that realization of reaching your goal and feeling like you're alone in the world, having that emptiness creep in and overwhelm her, sparking the rage itself. Setting aside that this is still very nonsensical and poorly translated by the writers. She's not her father and she's not insane and she's not a sadist, but there's a Targaryen ruthlessness that comes with even the good Targaryens. There's this discussion through the whole show of, of whether or not Daenerys is like her father, who was insane. So Danny was not crazy. Or was she? Which is it? Try to keep your story straight, you fucking idiots. Now, despite my disdain for the character of Daenerys, I've come to know that Amelia Clarke is a gem, a very sweet and likable actress, who has expressed a lot of humility and understanding for the fan outrage after the series finale, which is more than I can say for some. And this is where I've formulated a theory. You're all probably going to think I'm reaching with this, but here goes. When Amelia Clark says this... Bridge, and there's the emotion, and there's the feeling, and the feeling is to fucking kill her. Sorry. I don't think that Grey Worm can... Did you pick up on that? She says Danny's feeling is to kill her, not kill them. And despite this, Danny doesn't even aim for Cersei. She aims for everyone else. The actress is clearly in costume, but it's not the costume of the shot she's discussing. So perhaps this is her last day on set? Who knows, but we do know it's after she shot the sequence, and she's speaking from retrospect. On the season 8 documentary that shows the table read, it glosses over the footage of Amelia reading the script for this sequence. We see Jon and Tyrion have the same discussion in Tyrion's prison cell from the finale, and Danny's death plays out much the same. Did she sound like someone who's done fighting? She's a conqueror. She liberated the people of Slaver's Bay. She liberated the people of King's Landing. Our queen's nature is fire and blood. But we are left to assume that the script reads as if Danny is burning the city. However, if this article is to be believed, that's not quite the case. The scripts for Game of Thrones Season 8 Episodes 1-5 to can be found exclusively at a Los Angeles library. This article breaks down the script in Danny's last moments before going on her rampage, and I'll read it for you verbatim. One of the most important scenes in all of Game of Thrones came in this penultimate episode, The Bells, when Daenerys Targaryen sat atop Drogon and made the choice to slaughter innocent people by the thousands. This moment contained no dialogue. No explanation of her choice was provided beyond actress Amelia Clarke's contorted expression of anger and resolve. But now the episode's script is available to read at the Writers Guild Foundation, Shavelson Web Library in Los Angeles, and it helps further explain this pivotal choice made by the Mother of Dragons. Danny sees all the people below like little ants. The script says, Lannister Red, intermingled with fleeing civilians. She has won. But she sees the Red Keep, the script continues. The castle that her family built, that belongs to her, occupied by the False Queen. She has come so far, and she will go further. Then the showrunners, Dumb and Dumber, the writers credited for the Bells, reference the final line of a Robert Frost poem. Oh, blood will out, it cannot be contained. Drogon takes to the sky. The Flood is a Robert Frost poem about the inevitability of bloodshed. The Oh Blood Will Out phrase comes from the final line of the Frost poem titled The Flood. 
The poem is about the inevitable release of blood which will flow regardless of how one tries to dam it back. Here is the full poem which was published in Frost's 1928 book of poetry titled West Running Brook. Blood has been harder to dam back than water just when we think we have it impounded safe behind new barrier walls and let it chafe. It breaks away in some new kind of slaughter. We choose to say it is let loose by the devil, but power of blood itself releases blood. It goes by might of being such a flood, held high at so unnatural a level. It will have outlet, brave and not so brave, weapons of war and implements of peace, are but the points at which it finds release. And now it is once more the tidal wave, that when it has swept by leaves, some it stained. Oh, blood will out, it cannot be contained. Now, it makes me wonder why the script isn't spelled out in something akin to this. Danny and Drogon begin to rain fire down on King's Landing with its people fleeing. They are powerless, innocent or otherwise. Or something like that. But instead, they use a reference to this poem. And assuming they didn't do any last minute changes, and if this article is correct, then this is how the script was read at the table read. Now that poem reference reads like something you'd put into a novel, not a script. Scripts aren't meant to read like novels. It's my understanding that they are meant to say what they mean very specifically because they are governing actors and stage presence. Whereas the writing in a novel doesn't always need to explicitly say what is meant, so that it leaves some room for the audience to interpret it. But the only audience here is the cast members. They're the ones who are going to read the script. And likely not many, if any at all, will understand the context of that reference or its origin. So it's bizarre to me why they would reference a poem in their script writing for the table read. Now some might say it's very much implied what Danny was about to do, even with that poem reference. And be that as it may, my theory is this. Dumb and Dumber placed that into the script for the table read so as not to alarm any of the actors, especially Amelia. King's Landing is sacked, but most of the blood and the carnage comes from Danny's forces, not Danny herself. Which is why at the table read, John and Tyrion's scenes play out the same. Not only that, but here we see Dumb and Dumber say this. We wanted her to be just death from above as seen from the perspective of the people who are on the business end of that dragon. So to bring my theory full circle, after Danny makes her decision, Amelia Clark is no longer on set for this sequence. Yes, she's filming that episode up till the point where she's on the dragon. Meaning until she saw the full version of season 8 after post-production, Drogon could have been ballet dancing for all she knew. The rest of the sequence on her behalf is CGI. So is it possible? In addition to not wanting to provide nuance for her vile actions from Daenerys' perspective while she's committing these actions, Dumb and Dumber wanted to keep Amelia in the dark? Amelia herself makes it clear in the purposefully covered up featurette that Danny, from her perspective, based on the script and what the writers have told her, was not insane in that moment, and she was simply angry and overcome with pain. And the script from what I've seen, and I could be wrong as I haven't seen the full thing, purposefully keeps the extent of Danny's actions ambiguous on paper. So I pose the question, was Amelia Clark aware that Daenerys committed genocide by her own hand prior to the post-production release? I'll let you decide. Didn't see it coming. Final scene, I did not see that coming. So it was brilliantly written because it reads the way that it hopefully will play, which is, what? After all of everything that she'd done in the season, I almost felt relieved. She certainly knew prior to the premiere, likely having seen the finished product ahead of time. Best season ever! <laughs> but up until post-production was finished, I don't think it's too far-fetched to believe she was in the dark on the extent of Danny's vile actions for the majority of the production. It's not that she was oblivious to Danny committing any wrongdoing, but perhaps the sacking of King's Landing was framed in a way on paper that the majority of horror was due to the rampaging Unsullied, Dothraki and Northmen. Maybe it was written to imply that when Daenerys attacked the Red Keep, they saw that as a green light to kill, raid, pillage, rape, and continue massacring the people of King's Landing. And so Daenerys wouldn't be the one primarily responsible for the death and destruction of the entire city. But she'd still be the one to blame nonetheless. Which is why on the script, Tyrion and Jon still conspire to kill her in the end. As I said, I'm reaching with that theory, and I'm sorry to go off on such a tangent, but I really felt it was worth mentioning, and the point stands. Amelia Clarke was not made aware of Dumb and Dumber's true intentions with her character, Daenerys Targaryen, and her mental state during the filming of the King's Landing Massacre, which, as we know, she filmed very little for. There is a clear disconnect, 
And what is undoubtedly clear is that HBO clearly tried to cover it up. This featurette exists and they made a conscious effort to hide it. And we already know that Dumb and Dumber are liars. They did not plan this out from season 3. They destroyed Daenerys the same way they destroyed everything else. By being apathetic, incompetent, ego-driven, talentless, dumb fucks. Now with that said, let's see what else they have to say for themselves. Throughout the whole conversation they have, she really maintains like a reasonable approach to the thing that she's done. And there are only a few places where something peeks out that tells him what's really coming. Have she really maintains like a reasonable approach to the thing that she's done. And there are only a few places where something peeks out that tells him what's really coming. What about everyone else? They don't get to choose. big question in people's minds seemed to be who was going to end up on the Iron Throne. One of the things we decided about the same time we decided what would happen in the scene is that the throne would not survive. That the thing that everybody wanted, the thing that caused everybody to be so horrible to everybody else over the course of the past eight seasons was going to melt away. Well first off, thanks for giving zero payoff for the most significant object in the entirety of the show and the Song of Ice and Fire world. I hope there was a good reason for that. And secondly, that was the point of the White Walkers, you moron. Everyone was fighting for the throne until the White Walkers showed up. Then all of these conflicting parties came together to fight together for the greater good. Realizing the petty squabble for the chair was ultimately pointless compared to preserving life itself. The throne became practically meaningless on its own. But then you shut down that plot line in the most nonsensical way only to turn the focus back to the throne just to jerk off the audience one last time placing all emphasis on the throne only to give your audience the middle finger anyway because you knew they ultimately wanted someone to claim it. The dragon flying away with Danny's lifeless bodies that's the climax of the show. Danny flying off with the mass murdering Drogon is the climax of the show. What a boring fucking climax. What you fail to grasp is Danny is now an irredeemable genocidal monster. So hardly anyone cares about her character anymore. It took 40 minutes of walking and staring to get to that point because I for one read the leaks that you obviously didn't give a shit about and I had to will myself not to die of boredom before we finally reached that point in the story. And seriously, that was the climax. Not killing the leader of the undead or dethroning and executing the woman who caused the Seven Kingdoms so much misery, until Daenerys showed up that is. No, Danny's body being carried off is the climax. Not to mention the melting of the throne. Which by the way, the true intention behind the visual of the throne melting is that there's no real intent by Drogon. Or none that couldn't be summed up in Wah! Jon Snow killed my mommy! Wah! 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 Oh fuck, was that a chair over there? Oh well. Yeah, the Iron Throne was melted for simply existing at the wrong place at the wrong time, while Drogon was throwing a tantrum. There's no meaning or metaphor, it's simply a calculated fuck you on behalf of these two. Please clap. Also, you say that that's the climax and you just kind of forgot about that there's still shit to resolve? Well, that explains a lot, and thanks for confirming this. We see John with his hand still on the hilt of the dagger he just lodged in Danny's heart. <laughs> her strength leaves her, and she collapses to the marble. He keeps her in his arms, and she falls, kneeling down to the floor beside her. He looks down at what he's done, terrible and necessary. End of Game of Thrones. Woo! Yeah, you see, I thought something was cut out of the footage. But no, the original table read says, John kills Danny, end of Game of Thrones. So yeah, keep that in mind, because whatever else they say they planned, years and years and years in advance, well now, for the billionth time, in this video, we know that that's bullshit. What 
we didn't really realize was how much residual drama there was left. Once we realized that both John and Tyrion were inevitably going to be prisoners, we knew that their fate was far from settled. I'm sorry, but I just can't help but laugh at that. They had an epiphany that they would need to provide endings and resolutions for all of the characters that were still alive. Kind of forgot about. That the ending of a story traditionally has character payoffs and conclusions. They actually thought about ending Game of Thrones right there and then with Danny's death. Leaving the Dothraki out in the cold, along with Arya, Tyrion stuck in a cell, and Jon twiddling his thumbs in the ruins of the Red Keep. But honestly, this is so bad that I couldn't tell you if I'd prefer that ending or the one we got. Because at least that conclusion leaves us to think for ourselves. Before Dumb and Dumber decided to film the actual conclusion of this series, and it's a disaster. I don't know if I'd prefer a disaster with no conclusion, or an even worse disaster, but a conclusion nonetheless. And what do you mean you knew John and Tyrion were going to be prisoners? One was charged with treason, and the other was charged with regicide. And you think Grey Worm is just going to lock them in a cell? Grey Worm has killed men for less under orders. Now you think an unhinged, vengeful Grey Worm, with no one else to give him orders, is just going to keep them locked up? You do realise this is medieval Westeros, where you lose a hand for thievery, right? And just once, fucking once, can you do a time jump that actually helps the story instead of pissing everyone off? Why do you keep giving your best buddy off screen all the shit kicker jobs? Give him something good to do. Fuck. So we went through a number of different versions of, of how to best take advantage of that tension. And we finally landed on the version we had in the dragon pit. Yeah, well, at this point, I'm certain any of those other versions would have been better. I suppose you want the crown. Me? Can't think of a worse choice. Who then? Around season three, we went to visit George R. R. Martin, and he writes and he kind of figures things out as he's writing. When we went to visit him back then, and this was while he was still writing book five, he didn't know yet where the story was going, and he knew a few key things, and one of those key things was that the final king at the end of the story would be Bran. All have Bran the Broken. First of his name. Well, first off, if that's the case, way to blow the ending to a story three decades in the making with your verbal diarrhea and the shittiest execution that was beyond fathomable stupidity that we ever could have imagined you were capable of. Second of all, I don't buy it. George isn't an idiot. He would know better than anyone how badly you fucked up the ending. And the fact that you'd have that spoiler and ruined it so badly and still have a functioning relationship with George... I think you're flat out full of shit. If I was George, and this was the finale to my story that I trusted my actual ending for when I gave you the rights to adapt it and this was the end result, I wouldn't have just burnt the bridge, but I would have blown it the fuck up and found a way to sue your ass. It'd be really, it'd be fun to, it'd be fun to perpetuate that rumor and say that we had the ending in a safe. But uh, <laughs> I'm really tempted to say yes, <laughs> that's true. And then uh, that's not true. No. Yes, yes. No, George, George, Honestly, I think George would be the first one to tell you he doesn't work that way. <laughs> he doesn't write the ending and then and then figure out how to get to the ending he's already written. George likens himself all the time to a gardener as opposed mm -hmm. to an architect. He doesn't have a big blueprint where then he fills in the blanks or realizes the blueprint. He's He tinkers over here and he tinkers over there and he sees how something develops and then he changes things once he sees how they've grown over time. That's, that's how he writes is he'll be the first one to tell you mm -hmm. so yeah there's no no safe right. there is there are plenty of safes there's just none of none of them have the ending of game of thrones in them. You, like uh not only that but as dragon has captioned for us the production of season three and the ongoing manuscript for george r, r. martin's a dance of dragons novel does not line up do you guys see why i say dumb and dumber use season three as their safety net they probably just tell each other hey if you got to say you got an idea from just say we got it from season three and the audience will buy it. But as you all have seen, they couldn't keep their story straight. King of the Andals and the First Men. Lord of the Six Kingdoms. And protector of the realm. Lord Tyrion. You will be my hand. We knew that's where we wanted Tyrion to end up. Back where he started in that chair to try to, I think as Bran says in the scene about, he's made lots and lots of mistakes. 
for the past several years and now he's going to spend the rest of his life fixing them. Brand the Crippled King is the ending you came up with. Don't try to pawn it off on George. Who Tyrion the Prisoner recommended for having the quote unquote best story. Which would only be true in Bizarro World. Tyrion the Prisoner, which everyone decided to listen to when they could have listened to anyone else, essentially makes Bran the King. And then the new King Bran somehow gets Tyrion off the hook and gives him a position in power, but leaves his own brother to rot at the wall in what's essentially a life sentence. Brilliant work, you guys. Excellent job. Bravo. Eat a dick. And we thought that it would be a really fun group of people to have him making those repairs with. The Dragon Demands then goes on to outline how the dates line up and how the Night King was essentially inserted into Season 4 after they had their proposed meeting with Martin. Season 4 is apparently where they decide to start heavily deviating from the books. The Night King was impulsively created as their villain to carry through as the proposed main antagonist, when in actuality, they used him as a threat to build up season after season, only to flip him into a red herring, which amounted to nothing at the very last moment. Dragon Demands then goes on to list the most notable impulsive changes Dumb and Dumber made while working entirely on their own without George R. R. Martin's guidance. The rest of the clips in Dragon's video is a compilation of clips we have already seen that he has reorganized to prove the pattern of lying on behalf of the showrunners, and how the dates for various crucial decisions regarding the final season of Game of Thrones don't add up. I have linked Dragon's full video as well as his channel and the articles I mentioned below for your own curiosity should you decide to want to explore further, as well as the unlisted HBO video, as I previously mentioned. But that pretty much brings us to the end of this response, or dissection, whatever you want to call it. I'm sorry for the length, I kind of got carried away with this one, but honestly, it was both refreshing and painful to revisit Game of Thrones, and its finale, a whole year after its conclusion. Hard to believe it's already been that long, time flies as you're having fun. But yes, this brings us to the end. At this point, I think we've covered just about everything. My previous videos discuss Season 8 and its episodes in a sufficient amount of depth, as well as my behind-the-scenes dissection of Episode 5, and the news developments regarding Dumb and Dumber since the Season 8 finale aired, their new Netflix deal, loss of Star Wars contract, and most notably their confession of sheer incompetence while helming Game of Thrones. All of those videos are available and will always be there for your enjoyment. In addition with this one which was meant to sum up the post-mortem of Game of Thrones as a whole, and take a behind-the-scenes look at the finale episode, which we were deprived of due to the backlash and HBO not wanting to embarrass themselves any further. And in addition to that, this video was basically meant to dissect the timeline, why and when certain decisions were made that led to the downfall of Game of Thrones. So while this will likely be the last Game of Thrones video for some time, possibly ever, until new developments arise, that is, fret not. I will still be making videos, and in addition to that, I host a podcast every week called AI Core. And I've decided over the next six weeks that I will be dissecting every episode of Season 8 in full, starting with Episode 1 and 2. I can't wait to get started, and I hope to see you there. On that note, I'd like to give my outro. Let me start by saying thank you to The Dragon Demands for all his help collaborating with me on this project. You will not find a more informative Game of Thrones YouTube channel with more disdain for Dumb and Dumber than him. Please check him out. He has got a treasure trove of videos that both hardcore and casual fans can enjoy and learn from. The link for his channel is in the description. This video took a lot of time to write, edit, research, and put together. So I want to give a shout out and thank you to all of my patrons. You guys are phenomenal and I appreciate your support. If you would like to support my channel with a monthly donation, even if it's just a dollar per month, the link for Patreon will be in the description. In addition to that, I want to give a huge shout out and thank you to all of my YouTube members for all of their support and contributions to the channel as well. Thank you to the Star Killers, the Captain Prices, and the Master Chiefs. You are all awesome individuals and I appreciate you. If you'd like to become a channel member, click the join button below. Also, I have started a second channel with a separate, more specific branch of content for any of you who are interested. There's also the channel merchandise store for those of you who have been following this channel for some time. There's a bunch of memes in there specific to the channel that you may enjoy, Game of Thrones included. Give them both a look. But above all else, if you'd like to chat to me and my community about Game of Thrones and its downfall, your fond memories, your disappointment, and your memes, please head over to the channel's Discord server. What Discord basically is is an online community where viewers of this channel go to congregate and talk about a range of different topics, being Game of Thrones, Star Wars, Disney, Marvel, and Lord of the Rings to name but a few. I highly suggest you check it out, and who knows, maybe you'll make some friends along the way. 
Finally, I'd like to offer one last thank you for staying till the end of the video. You are a legend and I'll see you next time.